All right, so this is lecture 21, patents and antitrust number two. We're going to talk about Walker process fraud, sham litigation, and bad faith patent assertions. All right, so last time uh, I gave a brief history of the patent antitrust conflict, and we talked about this, this, this rubric of antitrust liability only attaching when the patent holder acts beyond the scope of the patent. We talked about patent to product tying and package licensing, which can potentially be compared to tying in this sort of patent to patent tying analysis. We talked about unconditional refusals to license and saw that those were generally legal. And we talked a little bit about the Supreme Court's upcoming decision regarding post expiration royalty payments. So before we get on to today's topic, which is the possibility of, 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 of imposing liability for patent enforcement activities, okay, before we do that, I just want to, to make a brief note. Uh, I, uh, I didn't uh, mention something that might uh, lead you to be confused, which is just the general procedure in those tying cases as to how the, the antitrust challenge would come about. So. In general, I would think it would go something like this. The patentee, and this is what we saw in some of the cases, like the Morton Salt case, the patentee will license uh, a patented product or or perhaps uh, offer a package license of standard essential patents based on a conditional license. And, and the condition might be something like, you can use our patented printer, but only if you use our ink. Or it could say something like, you can have this package of, of SEPs, but you also have, you have to license the whole package, uh, including all the patents that we want to put in there, not just the ones that you think are essential, not just the ones you want. So it's a conditional license. And then the licensee will in some way act outside the scope of the license. For example, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll use the, the manufacturer printers that don't actually use the patentee's ink or they'll stop paying the royalty fees for the package license. They'll just stop paying. And at that point, the patentee might sue for infringement, saying, well, that's that's an unauthorized use. It's out, unauthorized use outside the scope of your license, and so therefore you're liable for patent infringement. And then antitrust or patent misuse would come up as a counterclaim. And so the the uh, the... the the challenger would try to render the patent unenforceable or even get antitrust damages. And so that's that's generally, I think, how the procedure would go. And I just wanted to mention that in case you were confused by it. Okay, so let's let's go. All right, so this time we're gonna we're gonna talk about three different types of enforcement liability or three three sources of enforce, enforcement liability and enforcing patents. And the first is gonna be antitrust law. And as we'll see, there's two types of claims there. The second is going to be uh, from patent law, and and we're just going to talk about one of the the ways to to sort of challenge frivolous patent litigation. That's going to be uh, Section 285 attorneys' fees. We are going to then talk about a really interesting evolving area of law, and that is state law liability for for bad faith patent assertions. And then we're just quickly going to touch on reverse payment settlements. And that'll be it. Okay. So Walker process fraud. This is the the sort of oldest kind of way that we have to challenge the enforcement activities involving a patent. So uh, in general, of course, a patentee can do what it's wants. It can it can it can bring a lawsuit and say you are infringing the patent, but under certain circumstances, the patentee can be liable for antitrust law. And under this Walker process fraud claim, the elements are that the patentee is shown to have obtained the patent by knowing and willfully misrepresenting facts to the PTO. And that has to involve the elements of common law fraud. And you have to show that the patentee was aware of the fraud when bringing suit. So we'll get into the, the, the specifics of that. And of course, you'll note the similarity of that first element to inequitable conduct, and we'll talk a bit about that. So that's Walker process fraud. Uh, examples of knowing and, and willful misrepresentations, these are sort of classic examples, misrepresenting that the inventor had conceived, disclosed, and reduced to practice the invention on certain dates, misrepresenting that a widely known expert had authored an article praising the invention, an agreement to suppress 
evidence and litigation. So just some kind of misrepresentation to the to the PTO. That's that's kind of the, the, the level of fraud we're talking about. And it's it's a pretty high level of fraud, and we're going to talk about this in the, the Noble Pharma case. But uh, let's first talk about this other kind of enforcement liability. So that's the first one is, is the Walker process, and it has these two elements, fraud on the PTO, and then awareness of the fraud when bringing suit. The second kind is this sham litigation or sometimes called bad faith litigation claim, and that is based, it's sometimes called a handguards claim because of this Ninth Circuit case that, uh, that, that, that held this kind of liability. So a handguards game, a handguards claim generally relates to enforcement of a patent that was not obtained by fraud. So not like in the Walker process context, it's not necessarily obtained by fraud, but it's enforced in bad faith. And as we'll see, that generally means with, with knowledge that the patent was invalid or not infringed. Okay, so, so let's let's see what let's let's get let's understand this 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 standard further because it's an evolving standard. This sham litigation, bad faith standard has not always been the same. But the handguards claim that that we get the name from that's a Ninth Circuit case where the defendant was held to be liable for an antitrust violation based on asserting invalid patents against a competitor that impaired the competitor's relations with potential customers. It, 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 it aborted a proposed joint venture and it left the defendant unable to, uh, to obtain financing. So it really, it was, it was, it involved bad pat, invalid patents, was against a competitor and it compared, it impaired the, the, the competitor's business. That's what happened in handguards, and there was the Ninth Circuit upheld a large jury verdict finding an antitrust violation. So now the Federal Circuit has taken handguards and other other cases involving antitrust liability and has crafted a a standard that has to be met in order to in order to uh, get in a, a finding of antitrust liability. And the general idea, this is this is a Loctite case, we didn't read it, and it's just, it's just a case in the Federal Circuit talking about this handguards claim and what kinds of standards you need to meet to, to find, to have a finding of antitrust liability in enforcing a patent. And the court says, the barrier identified by handguards is that a patentee's infringement suit is presumptively in good faith. And this presumption can be rebutted only by clear and convincing evidence of bad faith. What that means is that generally the patentee has the right under the Patent Act to, to, to exclude others using its patents. So it can, it can uh, do what it wants in enforcing the patent. It can communicate uh, uh, notions. It can communicate to another that the person has infringed or it can bring a lawsuit and say and try to have the patent enforced in federal court. But the Federal Circuit is saying here that there, we need we need to have so we need to have limits. And so when when thing when patents are enforced, we presume that it's done in good faith. And the challenger is going to have to show if it wants to get treble antitrust damages, it's going to have to show that presumptively uh, just going to have to show that this this was done in bad faith. Okay, so the burden is really on the the anti the person trying to get anti antitrust damages here. Okay. So now a really important concept we need to understand for both for handguards claims and for the state law claims we're going to talk about later is nor Pennington immunity. This I'm going to call it nor meaning to immunity. It comes from some early cases in which the Supreme Court established a general principle of antitrust law that under the First Amendment, petitioning the government in order to enforce some federal right is not by itself a violation of antitrust law. And that stems from the language of the First Amendment that, that uh, immunize, that says that, that, that Congress uh, shall not prevent, uh, shall not present, prevent people from petitioning the government. And that has been interpreted to mean that the activities like bringing a lawsuit to enforce a patent are not by itself violations of antitrust law, that there's this sphere of immunity, and that's called nor immunity. 
So the Federal Circuit has taken NOR immunity and used it to recognize an exception for antitrust liabilities uh, uh, has 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 taken so this is this is the general normality norm immunity nor, generally it's applied in the antitrust context and it's 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 immunity from antitrust liability for activities directed toward influencing government action okay now at the federal circuit the 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 this is from globe frotter a case that actually as we'll see involves uh, state law but it, it it lays out the federal circuit's view on nor and how it applies in the patent enforcement conduct uh, so the, the court says, although NOR involved, itself involved only mere attempts to influence the passage or enforcement of laws, the court later extended NOR immunity for many trust to attempts to petition the government for redress through litigation in courts, okay? And then it says, so, so, so that, that, that means that in the Federal Circuit's interpretation, this gives you relative immunity to make good faith assertions of patent infringement under the First Amendment. But the Federal Circuit goes on to say the NOR court noted that immunity would not exist if the accused activity, although ostensibly directed toward influencing governmental action, is a mere sham to cover what is actually nothing more than an attempt to interfere directly with the business relationships of a competitor. And so there's the Federal Circuit recognizes that there can be cases where antitrust, antitrust liability can attach despite this First Amendment immunity. And that case is where the main main example of this is where the case the, the litigation is really just a sham to cover what is nothing more than an attempt to interfere directly with the business relationships of a competitor. It's not it's not really a valid claim of patent infringement. So that's the sham exception. And the Federal Circuit's notion of what this sham of what meeting this sham exception required requires is going to be shaped now by the Supreme Court, big Supreme Court case in this area, uh, Professional Real Estate Investors, PRE, in 1983, which laid out what the sham exception requires showing. And it has two elements, two elements. So the first is that the lawsuit is objectively baseless in the sense that no reasonable litigant could conclude that the suit is reasonably calculated to elicit a favorable outcome. And the second element, is that the patentee is shown to have the subjective intent to interfere directly with the business relationships of a competitor through the use of process rather than the outcome of the process as an anti-competitive weapon. Okay, so it's objective and subjective elements. And that PRE standard, now we can map that back on to what we saw in the handguards claim on the Ninth Circuit. And that's basically what the Federal Circuit sees now as the standards the standard for 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 bringing a handguards claim is you have to show that the 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 patentee was engaged in enforcement con conduct in 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 bringing a lawsuit that was objectively baseless and that was based on this subjective intent to interfere with the business relationships of a competitor. So that's the standard. Now, interestingly, the it's not clear from this traditional conception of sham litigation that this PRE standard would apply outside the context of actual litigation. Like what if somebody's just sending demand letters or making communications saying you have infringed our patent? Does, does the First Amendment immunity attach in those situations? You know, are you Are you immune? under the First Amendment for good faith attempts to bring, to, 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 to send, in sending demand letters. And the, the Federal Circuit has held that this, that the norm immunity also attaches to this kind of pre-litigation assertions of infringement. And that means that when someone objects to that kind of activity and says, oh, you might be liable for antitrust law, that you have to meet this sham litigation two-prong standard, objectively baseless and subjective intent to interfere with business relationships. So that is the framework for assessing whether particular conduct in enforcing a patent is, is going to get someone uh, uh, in trouble under the antitrust law. And 
So we've talked about these two distinct sources of enforcement liability then. The first is Walker process fraud, and we saw the elements of that. And the second is this sham litigation as an exception to First Amendment immunity. So a question sort of left open by the foregoing discussion is whether is is whether these are separate these are separate because they come from different lines of cases, right? The Walker process fraud is this earlier case, and then we've got sham litigation is coming from this line of Nor Pennington cases. So the question is, are there two distinct sources of enforcement liability under antitrust law? And that's the question that the court, the Federal Circuit has is uh, this is a Federal Circuit case, the Noble Pharma v. Implant Innovations case, where the Federal Circuit lays out that issue and has to address it and decides to address it as a matter of federal circuit law. So this is a good case. We read this case because it really goes through both these kinds of claims you can bring and it's a good way to understand exactly what kind of standards you have to meet for Walker process especially. Okay, so the facts of this case are that the, there was a US patent filed in 1980 for a, a particular dental implant and the, uh, the inventors, there's two inventors, and they've exclusively licensed this patent to Noble Pharma. Okay, and the, the claimed invention is an element intended for implantation into bone tissue. Now, a key point of novelty in the invention, uh, and the, the, the specification reveals this, is that the, the claimed implants are made of titanium, and they have a network of particularly sized and spaced micro pits that allow a secure connection to form between the implant and the bone tissue. Okay, so that's the facts of the case. Now, the jury findings, the jury had upheld, a, had, had found basically what, what, what looks like a Walker, prod process, a Walker process fraud case. It had found first that the inventor, oh, oh my goodness, first that the inventors uh, obtained their patent through fraud, and so that, so that the, the fraud element was met. Uh, also, the jury found that, that Noble Pharma had knowledge of the fraud at the time the action was commenced against the defendants. That's the second element of, of, of Walker process. And, or, and, 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 and further, that, that the Noble Pharma brought the, the lawsuit against the defendant knowing the patent was either, un, either invalid or unenforceable with the intent of interfering directly with the defendant's ability to compete in the relevant market. So we've got all of these elements of Walker process satisfied here, that the, the patent was obtained through fraud, that Noble Pharma had knowledge of both the fraud itself and with uh, knowing that the patent was either invalid or, or unenforceable. And there was also this intent to interfere directly with defendants' ability to compete in the relevant markets. So there's a lot of stuff going on here that looks bad, and it, it looks it looks like both both kind of pieces of, of, of both the Hangard's claim and, and especially this Walker process claim. But this is what the jury found. Now, the grounds for appeal are twofold. So there's this appeal to the Federal Circuit. And the first uh, ground for appeal that Noble Pharma says is that the jury finding that the patent was obtained through fraud and that Noble Pharma knew of that fraud when it sued was not supported by substantial evidence. The second ground for appeal is that the, the judge failed to instruct the jury on nor immunity, nor Pennington immunity. So the judge failed to talk about any of the First Amendment protection, protections that Noble Farmer would potentially have, and it failed to tell the jury, look, you need to you need to note you need to note jury that bringing a lawsuit cannot be the basis for antitrust liability if the suit was not objectively baseless, meaning that the jury didn't understand, according to Noble Pharma, the jury didn't understand that they would have to make this additional finding that the suit was objectively baseless. So now the the Federal Circuit finds this case important, and it, and and it it notes that a lot of these issues are matters of uh, to some extent for first impression with respect to patent law and so it says we're gonna we're gonna decide, decide these issues as a matter of federal circuit law rather than relying on various regional precedents we're not going to deal with all those all the divided views we are going to decide how walker process fraud how all this stuff is going to be dealt with at the federal circuit and how nor immunity is going to apply here and so okay so we, we've got these two issues to resolve 
First, what, what level of intent and reliance are required to establish the patentee engaged in fraud on the PTO and had knowledge of the fraud uh, when enforcing the patent? What, what level of, what, what are the fact findings that are required for that? And second, uh, is it necessary that the challenger show, in addition to those sort of typical elements, that they, the challenger show that the patentee's conduct has risen to the level of sham litigation. Does it has does there have to be this sort of jury instruction on a, a nor immunity? Is there this additional finding required in order to get antitrust damages? And as to the first issue, the the Federal Circuit lays out a very high standard of proof uh, for for uh, for establishing a Walker process fraud, and. It says it basically says first of all that there's this there's a high standard of proof a finding of Walker process fraud requires higher threshold showings of both intent and materiality the end does a finding of inequitable conduct it has to be really really bad specific intent and uh, you have to so you have to bring independent and clear evidence of deceptive intent together with a clear showing of reliance and materiality as to the as as res with respect to things like prior art that hasn't been revealed. So basically, the court uses the same but for standard of materiality that we saw in Theracense. It's this idea that you have to you really have to show specific intent to deceive the PTO and that the patent would not have issued but for the representation or omission. Okay, so it's it's like inequitable conduct, but supposedly even higher, although it's possible that after their sense, they're both just very, very high, because this is this case is in 1998. So the point is it's very, very high, and you're not going to get antitrust damages unless you meet this standard. Okay, so what about the facts here? So why does, because the Federal Circuit then goes on to uphold the district court and the, the, the jury's findings, what kind of evidence did the, the court think was enough in this case? Well, first of all, the court thinks that there is certainly substantial evidence that the inventors failed to disclose material prior, material prior art to the PTO. There was a, a book authored by one of the inventors and published in 1977. That's like three years before the, the patent, the U.S. patent was filed. And it discloses micro pits within the size range claimed in the, the 1980 patent. And it disclosed them on a single page and described them in a caption. I didn't refer to them as micro pits, but this is clearly a, a, a enabling disclosure. And then in a Swedish patent application on pretty much the same invention filed in 1989, uh, one of the inventors submitted a written description mentioning the book and discussing the implants. But then uh, th th then made no mention uh, of the of the of the of the disclosure in the 1980 U.S. patent, so that really that kind of evidence the court thinks is 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 very sufficient to show. Oh, uh, uh, and, and 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 perhaps even worse, so the initially the showing even more that the inventor initially submitted a written description in the Swedish patent mentioning the implants, but then actually deleted it thereafter. So it's almost like just this deliberate, uh, this deliberate. Uh, attempt to hide from the PTO what the inventor seemed to know. That's what this, you know, this evidence is all circumstantial and that's okay. You can, it's, you don't have to have, you know, a statement that I knew, the inventor saying I knew and I deliberately didn't disclose, but you have to um, have pretty good circumstantial evidence and the, the court thinks this is enough circumstantial evidence here, both that the the, the prior art was material, that it might have been invalidating because it was an, able, an, a, an enabling disclosure of something really important about the invention, and also that the inventors knew about it and failed to disclose it. So then there's also this question of whether the inventors knew of the fraud, the Noble Pharma knew of the fraud uh, when, it, when it enforced the patent, and I think there's sort of this smoking gun, smoking gun evidence of of, of the knowledge of the fraud, which is that the, the Noble Pharma, Pharma officer told another, another officer at the company that if the patent office did not receive a copy of that 1977 book, and if that were true, then we would have a larger problem, and that was fraud. 
So that kind of looks pretty bad as to knowledge of fraud going on. And in addition, there was also this legal opinion from an attorney to the company that if it were if we were to sue, we would lose in the first round. There was prior art that would invalidate the patent. So this all looks pretty bad, and, and this kind of gives you an idea of the really high level, I think, of, of evidence that will be, is required to, to, sh to show Walker process fraud. Okay, so that's, that's the standard. This is but for materiality and a very high level of specific intent. Okay, now what about this second, this second really purely legal issue is, is what is, is did, was there a problem in the court not instructing? So given that we have, I think, these elements of Walker process fraud shown, did the jury also have to get a jury instruction on First Amendment immunity and sham litigation and saying, look, you've, you've got to show that the lawsuit was objectively baseless. And the Federal Circuit says no. And the reason is that there are two sources, two distinct sources of antitrust enforcement liability. And that's how we've really set up this part of the lecture, right, is there's two. There's the first one, you can get Walker process fraud and the elements of it there are that the patentee obtained the patent by knowingly and willfully, willfully misrepresenting facts, the PTO engaged in fraud. Uh, and, and second, that the, the, the patentee was aware of the fraud when bringing the suit. And then there's also this second type, separate type that you can get, and this is the, the handguards claim, the sham litigation sufficient to strip the patentee of nor immunity. Objectively baseless lawsuit, possibly also a, an assertion, pre-litigation assertion of infringement. And it was also subjectively brought, brought in bad faith with the intention to interfere with the business of a competitor, and you have to be aware of that careful, that be careful with the standard there for bad faith, for sham litigation, or remember it's this PRE case, the Supreme Court case, you have to meet these, these elements, the objectively baseless and subjective, subjective intent to interfere, these specific elements. So that is, that's the first, the first topic, that was antitrust laws uh, antitrust law is a source of enforcement liability. Now, the next topic, just to quickly, quickly talk about, because it's it's very similar, is this this idea that you can actually get attorneys' fees. You can do uh, sanctions under Rule 11, but don't don't worry too much about that. This is not necessarily patent law specific. There are various ways to sanction a, a litigant for frivolous uh, actions during during litigation, but. Within patent law, we actually have this specific provision, section 285, uh, that provides for attorney's fees. And it says the court in exceptional, this is the words of the statute, the court in exceptional cases may award reasonable attorney's fees to the prevailing party. And that might imply that when a litigant, uh, for example, when a patentee uh, enforces its patents and during the course of litigation or even possibly before litigation uh, engages in just really exceptionally bad conduct, the court can, can, can potentially change the usual rule and require the, the uh, patentee, if it loses, to then pay the attorney's fees of the winning party. So that might cover a case, um, a case for example, like where a patentee is uh, is brings a, a really weak lawsuit and then ultimately loses in a really bad way and during the whole course of the trial uh, just does things to delay the suit or things that, 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 that seem exceptional, the court can shift fees to the prevailing party. However, under the Federal Circuit's old standard, it was very hard to meet this the, the standard for two, the, the exceptional standard for 285, the Federal Circuit had had, had held in um, in cases like Brooks Furniture Manufacturing that uh, a case may be deemed exceptional under 285 only when there has been some material inappropriate conduct, or when the litigation is both brought in subjective bad faith and objectively baseless. And to me, that looks that very much tracks we've already seen this sort of really kind of bad material 
conduct that's, that's maybe involving fraud, inequitable conduct, or this, um, this sham litigation standard where it was both objectively and subjectively baseless. So that was the Federal Circuit's old standard, which was very hard to meet, and not many attorneys' fees were shifted in that way. But now recently, in this Octane Fitness case, the Supreme Court has changed this law and has said that that standard was not, uh, was not right, and that, in fact, the statute doesn't have such a high standard for getting attorneys' fees. And some people think this case... And I think this case comes in, in the wake of critiques of patent trolls and this idea of that patent trolls is sort of a derogatory term for non-practicing entities, for patent assertion entities. And we're going to talk about that in a side lecture on this particular topic. But it's just this, uh, the point is that, there, that this, this case comes down in a, in a framework where people are really upset about patent holders bringing suits against, particularly when the patent holders don't practice themselves and are suing perhaps small businesses and and maybe their claims are quite weak. So at any rate, in Octane Fitness, Supreme Court changes the standard, says an exceptional case is simply one that stands out from others with respect to the substantive strength of a party's litigating position, considering both the governing law and the facts of the case, or the unreasonable manner in which the suit was litigated. District courts may determine whether a case is exceptional in the case-by-case -case exercise of their discretion, considering the totality of the circumstances. So that language, the totality of the circumstances and the, and the, the discretion, that implies that district courts should have, under this new standard, much more leeway to grant attorneys' fees to prevailing parties. So that is, that is Section 285, and this is is another way, besides antitrust liability, that you can potentially get a transfer to a prevailing party uh, in, a, in, a pat, in, a, in, a, in a case where enforcement activity has not been, um, has, has been potentially uh, uh, something that we want to deter. So, so the final sort of topic is this another source of liability for enforcing in, in conduct and enforcing patents is this state law liability for bad faith patent assertions. So there's been some really interesting developments in this area. So prior to May 2013, and historically, there have been a variety of sources of state state law liability that might impose liability on conduct in enforcing patents. And this is consumer protection laws, deceptive trade practices, statutes, tort laws, tort law and unfair competition. These are sources of state law that had previously been used. What would often, what the procedure would usually be that someone is sued for patent infringement and then there's a lawsuit and the, it's decided and the, the defendant wins the case and along with winning uh, winning the case and not being found liable for infringement, they'll also counterclaim for, for under state law and try to get maybe some compensatory damages or even exemplary damages under these state law sources. And so it would generally happen after the case had been litigated and it was and the, the strength of the of the case has become apparent because it's all been flushed out. We know whether the patent's valid, we know how the infringement analysis went. But now, on uh, May 22nd, 2013, Vermont passed a new law under its, under its consumer, General Consumer Protection Act, passed a new law specifically directed at bad faith assertions of patent infringement. And this is, this is the, what the law essentially does. It says a person shall not make a bad faith assertion of patent infringement. They're going to be liable under this, under this statute. And the Vermont Attorney General thereafter, or, or contemporaneously, uh, sued a patent troll, this company MPHJ, that had been sending demand letters to companies across the U.S. in different states 
including Vermont companies. And so the Attorney General sued this so-called notorious troll, MPHJ, and it claimed that the demand letters violated Vermont's consumer protection statute. It, uh, the, the Attorney General actually didn't use this new law for whatever reason. The Attorney General used the General Consumer Protection Act, but the, the, the implication is that this is, that, that the, this is really under the new law. So, so the state states sought an injunction requiring the patent holder to stop threatening Vermont businesses, include, and then also sought restitution and civil penalties of up to ten thousand dollars for each violation. So this is this is the first action that was taken based on this, and thereafter, uh, thereafter, over fifteen states have passed similar laws, and many of them uh, are based on this this original Vermont model. Uh, here's a. a we're going to talk about the, the details of the, the Vermont law, which you read uh, in a second, but I just want to point out that the Pennsylvania didn't, hasn't, as far as I know, has not a, yet adopted this, but they did introduce a, a bill proposing a, a, a law under the Vermont model prohibiting bad faith assertions of patent infringements. This is that the, here, here in Pennsylvania, that's the, the proposed bill. Now, so the what 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 is this law? So, okay, so we've got 15 states, most of them based on the Vermont model, passing these bad faith patent assertion laws. The general outline of the law is that the, the that there's there's two kinds of actions. The state attorneys general can bring civil actions, and then there's also a source a, a, a source of liability coming a pri basically private rights of action targets targets of bad faith assertions can bring private actions in state court, and they can do so before a patent suit has been filed in federal court. And we'll talk about that timing issue in a second. Uh, so targets of pat bad faith patent assertions can bring private actions seeking liabilities. Prevailing plaintiffs can get equitable relief, meaning an injunction to say stop this bad faith assertion. They can get compensatory damages. They can get costs and, and, and attorney's fees. They can get exemplary damages in an amount equal to fifty thousand dollars or three times, looks like. And there's also this bond requirement of up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is very unusual. So, in my view, some of the key innovations of this there's various innovations that come with this these new laws that did not necessarily exist, or at least not explicitly, not in a way that they would be frequently used, did not necessarily exist in the old state law. So the first is this idea that patent holders, patent asserters, can be liable under state law before a lawsuit is filed in federal court. So here under the Vermont law, a target who is who a target who can sue under the new under the law is defined as a Vermont person who has, for example, received a demand letter or against whom an assertion or allegation of patent infringement has been made or has or who has been threatened with litigation or whose customers have received a demand letter asserting infringement. So what this says is that you can sue under this law before you've actually been sued in federal court and for patent infringement and certainly before the patent infringement suit has been litigated. So it's just after you've received demand letters. But you do have to be located in Vermont. This is or whatever state that the the law is based in, obviously. So there's also this bond requirement that says upon, upon motion by a target and a finding by the court, and that'll probably be a state court, that a target has established a reason, unless there's a case, well, we'll see this in a second, but unless there's a source of, of federal jurisdiction, if it's just a state law claim, assuming the law is upheld, it would be a state court hearing this, and upon motion by a target, uh, that the target has a staff it was once the target so the target will make a motion saying they've established a reasonable likelihood that a person has made a bad faith assertion of patent infringement in violation of this chapter then the court shall require so presume seems like they have to require the person that is the patent asserter to post a bond and that bond can be in an amount equal it, amount equal to the good faith estimate of the target's costs to litigate the claim and the amounts reasonably likely to be recovered, uh, it, it, it can be up to $250,000. So that is 
pretty significant. So if you're a patent holder and you bring an assertion and the court finds based on the, the complaint that, that uh, the, the, the target has made a showing of reasonable likelihood of success, then you, ha you can have to pay this, this bond. So the other key innovation that these laws, new state laws do is that they create a discretionary standard for bad faith and they lay out a variety of non-exhaustive factors that the court may consider in deciding whether uh, whether uh, a patent holder has has made a bad faith assertion and it includes a variety of factors and uh, you can you can look at them in the the, since you had the law for the reading, you could look at them, but here's a few of the, just a few select ones I selected. Uh, the demand letter does not contain the following information, and the statute lists a variety of information like the name of the patent holder, uh, the patent number, etc. Uh, the demand letter demands payment of a license fee or response to the letter within an unreasonably short period of time. The, the person, the patent holder, offers to license the patent for an amount that is not based on a reasonable estimate of the value of the license. The claim or assertion of patent infringement is meritless, and the person knew or should have known that the claim or assertion is meritless. And there's a variety of other factors, and then it says, and any other factor the court finds relevant. And the statute also lists a variety of factors that might be a show, might indicate an absence of bad faith. So this is, this is new. There's this whole... Uh, specific information given at the statutory level as to what might constitute bad faith. And that's pretty different from the kind of bad faith that we've been seeing so far in the, for example, in the nor sham, sham petition exception context, context, there was, there were no specifics. The idea was just it had to be objectively or subjectively baseless, but we don't have this list of, of factors to consider. So that's pretty interesting. Now, the really key question and the key question is, is, is whether these laws are going to be allowed to persist or whether they're going to be held to be preempted, right? Because federal, patent law is federal, right? And so the way preemption works under the, the Constitution, under the Supremacy Clause, is that when the federal government is, just as a general matter, when the federal government has significant authority in an area and is, is doing... Um, a relatively significant, and here a very significant, administrative scheme, there's going to be a high likelihood that states are going to be precluded from engaging in, in similar actions and certainly from engaging in actions that conflict with what the federal government is doing. So are these laws preempted? The case that you read is this Globetrotter case where it's from 2004, so it's before the new laws were passed, but it related to general state tort law liability and, 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 and did address directly the question of whether federal patent law preempts state law tort liability. And the solution that the court came to in Globetrotter was that these laws are not per se preempted, they, if states can impose some liability for patent holders um, pre-litigation or, or during litigation assertions of infringement, uh, but state law claims can survive federal preemption only to the extent that those claims are based on a showing of bad faith action in asserting infringement. Now, where do we know this language, this bad faith language? Where is this coming from? Well, in Globe Trotter, in Globe Trotter, the court makes clear that it's coming from both patent law and the First Amendment, from this nor immunity uh, that we saw earlier. And so the court in Globe Trotter basically says that nor immunity applies to state law claims as well as federal antitrust claims. So, uh, the cases, the court says, the cases applying NOR to pre-litigation communications have dealt almost exclusively with, the, exclusively with the protections provided by federal antitrust law for pre-litigation communications. However, in another line of cases, our sister circuits have also applied the NOR line of cases to bar state law liability as opposed to federal antitrust liability. 
This extension of NOR is based on the fact that the same First Amendment principles on which NOR immunity is based apply to the state law tort claims. And of course that makes some sense since, as we know, the First Amendment has been incorporated into the 14th Amendment and applies to states as well. So the reasoning is, well, if, if, if First Amendment applies in the, federal, in the context of federal antitrust regulators, why wouldn't it apply to when state laws try to regulate patent assertions. And this is very interesting and, and, and we'll talk more about scholarship in this area, but so, okay, so to, to conclude, so what does this mean that bad faith has to be? So to avoid, to avoid being preempted, uh, uh, state law claims alleging bad faith assertions of patent infringement, the underlying uh, patent infringement lawsuit must be both subjectively and objectively baseless in the sense that no reasonable litigate litigant could realistically expect success on the merits. Moreover, the, the Federal Circuit doesn't specifically say exactly what this entails, but language in the Globe Potter Trotter case suggests to me that the reason the Federal Circuit doesn't think the standards is met here is that the challenger made no effort to establish that the claims asserted by Globe Trotter with respect to the patents were objectively baseless either because those patents were obviously invalid or plainly not infringed. So to me that suggests that the court has in mind for this objectively baseless prong that the patents really, first of all, they have to have been invalid or not infringed and that they, it has to have been very obvious up front that, they, that that was the case. So that's going to be potentially a problem for the state law claims, right? So first of all, we've got this discretionary, discretionary standard for bad faith. Uh, it could be that in applying this standard, courts do not meet the objectively baseless standard just laid out. It could be that they would prevent enforcement conduct that's really, that's made based on perfectly valid assertions of patent infringement and that could potentially happen I mean it's a, it's a discretionary standard these are just factors a court may consider on the other hand if we look at factor six here the claim or assertion of patent infringement is meritless and the person knew or should have known that the claim or assertion is meritless that kind of resembles the the uh, the, the bad faith standard that we know from Globetrotter and the Vermont, in the Vermont Act, there's some prefatory language that says we, we understand something like, we understand that the, uh, that we, we, we don't want to, we don't want to pass a law that is, that is preempted by federal law. We understand that and, and we're trying to, to fall within the, the, the right preemption standard. So it could be that this is sort of a message to, to, uh, courts that you need to apply this in a way that meets the federal circuit's bad faith standard of objectively and subjectively baseless. But I also think there's a there's an administrative problem here because if the standard is this, if it's bad faith in the sense that the patents were obviously invalid or plainly not infringed, how are we going to do things like let people bring claims in state court after they've been, before they've been sued for patent infringement, based just on demand letters from patent holders, and 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 you want to say those those demand letters were bad faith assertion of assertions of patent infringement? How are we going to decide whether they were really brought in bad faith in the sense of the patents being invalid or not infringed if we're in state court? And the court has not been, the, the patent claim has not been litigated. If you look at the jurisdiction statute, 28 U.S.C. 1338, giving exclusive jurisdiction to federal courts on patent cases, it's, it's recently been amended in 2011 to say no state court, and this has pretty much always been the case, no state court shall have jurisdiction over any claim for relief arising under any act of Congress relating to patents. So that implies that it's not going to be possible to litigate these, these the, at least under the Federal Circuit's current standard, it's not going to be possible to fully decide these bad faith assertion cases 
prior to going into federal court and deciding the patent lawsuit. So the idea of putting up bonds and having these claim these these uh, complaints be bought, be brought very early in the course of patent of a patent uh, assertion that seems to be administratively unworkable, assuming that the federal circuit's law is currently the standard. So are the laws preempted? We've got. At this point, we have at least three cases deciding on the issue, and in two cases, Northern District of Illinois and District of Nebraska, courts held that they were preempted or at least dismissed on a motion to dismiss in the Northern District of Illinois case, and then in the Nebraska case, held holding that the Attorney General's actions were preempted. And, and, and basically, I think the reasoning is what I was just saying, is that it's if, if we've, you've got to have these assertions of, you have to have these allegations that the, the, the claims are bought and brought in, uh, that, that they're objectively basis, but you can't really decide that in state court. And especially if the allegations of, of objective baselessness are just absent from the complaint, you're going to be dismissed under Rule 12b-6. So two cases preempted. This other case in Vermont itself, the original state, they're not preempted and remanded to state court. So what happened there? Well, the 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 patent troll, so-called patent troll, that was that had been um, sued by the attorney general, went moved into uh, federal court to the the United States District Court for the District of Vermont. Tried to be removed there and claimed that the state's action under the Vermont Consumer Protection Law was preempted by federal patent law and would impact its federal patent rights, and this created exclusive ju federal jurisdiction over the case and warranted removal to federal courts. There's two, there was basically two claims. First, that the law is preempted by federal law, and second, that that uh, removal to a federal court was warranted because of, of patent law jurisdiction. But the district court for Vermont has none of this, and first says that the state's complaints brings claims solely under state law for unfair and deceptive practices, and its claims are premised on multiple theories that do not implicate federal patent law. So it it basically says that these this this is not uh, well it doesn't hold that they're preempted, and then it uh, it remands to state court to decide this to decide the the issue of bad faith. It says because the case could not have been filed in federal court under the jurisdiction statutes, the court grants the state's motion and remands the case to uh, to state court under the well pleaded complaint rule. So the idea is there's just no basis for federal jurisdiction, and it's completely possible to decide this issue of bad faith under under state law. And that really does seem to conflict, in my view, with a lot of the Federal Circuit case law on this. So we will see. This is very interesting. We've got a split among federal courts on how they're deciding this issue. Maybe it will go up the ranks and we'll see a final decision Later on, oh, and of course, it's already going up the ranks. So, right, so this Vermont order was appealed to the Federal Circuit uh, panel of three judges, Judge Pross, Newman, and Judge Hughes. And they they simply stated very concisely, an order remanding a case to the state court from which it was removed is not reviewable on appeal or otherwise. Here, the Vermont District Court repeatedly stated the, petition, the position that the court does not have subject matter jurisdiction. We therefore lack jurisdiction to review. So the Federal Circuit did not get involved either. So for now, this is the situation with states coming out, with, this, with courts coming out in different ways across the country. Now, within academia, there are divided views on whether these laws are or should be preempted. And Paul Guglielmo has a excellent piece on this forthcoming in I think the Virginia Law Review, and it's 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 uh, it's he argues Guglielmo argues that the First Amendment uh, immunity under NOR does not apply outside antitrust law. He argues that's just wrong because we've seen in this course of this lecture how the, the Federal Circuit imported. Nor immunity, and 
and he argues that that's just a, a creation of the federal circuit and it's just wrong. And then he argues, he argues that without First Amendment immunity, the new state laws would actually survive preemption as a matter of patent law. He doesn't think that patent law on its own creates a source of immunity from state regulation. And that is actually a little controversial in my view, but uh, so states, right, so the second, uh, another person writing on this is Robin Feldman, and Robin Feldman has written a significant amount of literature being very skeptical of patent trolls, and she has, she gave an excellent talk at Yale Law School recently, where she argued that states have broad concurrent authority to create liability and enforcing patent rights, including detailed disclosure rules for patent assertions, and she compared she compares states' concurrent authority in the patent context to their consumer their their concurrent authority to regulate in other areas like corporate law. So she has some very interesting things to say. And now my own view, my own view, which I'm writing on this, and I think that even so I think Google has a point that nor amendment, nor immunity, you know, it's been brought into this area. I don't think that the Federal Circuit was unreasonable in doing that. As I already said, if the First Amendment applies to states and it it uh, it uh, does, so it doesn't seem like if circuit courts all over the country have been applying it in similar contexts, it just doesn't seem to me that nor wouldn't apply here. But be that as it may, even if we decide that, look, nor immunity shouldn't apply outside the antitrust and it really shouldn't apply to state regulation outside the antitrust context, even, even if that's the case, I think the laws are preempted in full or at least in part by federal patent law itself under the Constitution and the Patent Act. And I am researching this now and I am uh, writing a piece on this and I will give my full iteration of why I think this is the case historically, legally, and as a matter of policy. So that is, those are the divided views within academia. And of course you guys, I'm very excited to hear what you have to say because the exercise we're doing this week is going to address a lot of this stuff and you'll have your, a chance to make your own, uh, give your own thoughts on this. Okay, so the last topic I just want to quickly go over is our reverse payment settlements. And the reason we're talking about this at all is because I mean, we've, we've already covered a lot, but the, the reason is that there's been a major change in, in this, a major development in this area from the Supreme Court in this uh, FTC v. Octavius case that we read. So, okay, so first thing to understand is going back to sort of the principles of antitrust law, uh, the conduct in antitrust law can either be vertical involving sort of, um, for example, a license arrangement between a patentee and a licensee who has, to, who operates in a different market or they can be horizontal, and a horizontal relationship would be a relationship between direct competitors. So there's a variety of horizontal, of conduct in the patent space that, that might implicate horizontal collusion among competitors. So, so I say, so horizontal conduct is generally treated less favorably in antitrust law than vertical conduct, and that's simply because it's it, it it's among direct competitors, so there's a potential chance for collusion, people to say sort of we're not going to compete or we're going to fix prices. And so, a few examples. One we've already mentioned, we've already talked about, is patent pools, and we saw how the FTC sometimes will, or the the DOJ rather, will sometimes issue uh, business review letters and say to patent pools, yeah, yeah, you guys can get together in order to form these licensing. Uh, one-stop shop licensing, uh, uh, licensing businesses or whatever, but you have to meet these agreements. You have to license on non-discriminatory terms to other people, etc. And that's sort of sort of to alleviate this risk of horizontal collusion. Uh, there could also be licenses that fix prices. So, for example, uh, you can use my patent if you keep the price above a certain level. 
there could be a naked payment not to compete. The patent holder could just pay a potential competitor and say, stay out of the market and I'll pay you. That looks pretty bad under, or ordinarily without the patent, it would look pretty bad under antitrust law. And then lastly, uh, another major example of what we're going to talk about here is this, and it's closely related to the payment not to compete, is, is the reverse payment settlement. And in this context, what happens is a draw, uh, the holder of a, this, this happens within the framework, the specific framework of the drug approval process. That's what we're dealing with. And a, the, the holder of a patent on a drug will transfer a large sum of money to a generic company who wants to market a generic version of the drug uh, in the, that's supposed to say, in the course, in the course of a patent settlement and that, and that takes place in the framework of the drug approval process. So, okay, so this is the basic situation, so and the reason this looks suspicious. So in an ordinary settlement, right, the patentee sues an, uh, an alleged infringer, an, inf an alleged infringer, the infringer then pays the patentee and they settle the claim and a trial is avoided, and a trial is avoided, right? It's like, well, I may have infringed, it's not clear, but we'll, we'll, we'll settle it. And I'll, and I'll just pay you a bit and the, the patentee won't um, pursue. And there may be some transfers in this context to the patentee. It's not necessarily, I mean, we don't know always what happens in these settlements, but it's not, it's not you know, always just a transfer from the defendant to the, to the patentee. It could be that there, was, there were counterclaims and so they settled the counterclaims too. But the point is that in general, that's gonna look different from what happens in the reverse payment settlement where the patentee pays the infringer a significant sum of money to settle a claim of infringement and a trial is avoided. So here the transfer is significant and, 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 and entirely, seeming, enti seemingly entirely to the, to the alleged infringer. And so this occurs in this specific context of the, the, case, the place where we see this is in the context of the Hatch-Waxman Act's approval, uh, Hatch-Waxman Act framework for approving drugs. So in this in this framework, what happens is a drug manufacturer that wants to make a new drug and get approval from the FDA will file a new drug application, um, one, and then the FDA will grant its approval, saying, yes, this looks safe to market. The drug manufacturer will then enjoy, assuming it has a Pretty much always has a patent. It will then enjoy, you know, some period of exclusivity from competition. So we manufacturing the drug, but relatively early in this process, the generics are permitted to begin filing. Because remember, the, the the what happens here is that we want eventually, as a society, we would like there to be cheaper versions of the drug uh, that that are not on brand and that are made by generics, and so. What will happen is that the generic, generic is permitted to get approval through this abbreviated new drug application by certifying that the same active ingredients are, are, that are used or, that, or biologically equivalent ingredients are used. And this is just to avoid a lot of the time and the time and money that would be taken, you know, retesting everything and um, redoing the whole approval process. It's just it's like a way to speed up the process. The generic can just sort of say, we're going to use the same ingredients. Don't worry about too much about the safety. And they also have to get um, their, their their methods for making those ingredients are, are are to some extent regulated, but that's a different issue. So, so then the generic will certify. So, what about the patent, right? Because there's still a patent in force. There may be many more years on patent uh, exclusivity when this generic gets the files the ANDA. So the generic also will has various options, but one of them is under paragraph four. It can certify that the patent is invalid or not infringed. That is to say, look, we are permitted to enter this market and sell our generic because the patent is, is invalid or we haven't infringed it. We're doing something slightly different. A key issue here is the invalidity. So because the patent is invalid, so we can we can enter. So and that will create a 30-month stay of the ANDA until the patent infringement issue is resolved. Now note the big prize for the winning generic. If, the, if a generic gets approval, it gets 180 days of exclusivity against other generic competitors. So it's almost like it gets its own little mini exclusivity period as vis-a-vis as -vis other generics. 
So what this situation does is it creates unusual incentives. It creates a situation where if the drug manufacturer with the patent loses in a paragraph four litigation and it's found that the patent is invalid, it loses, it could potentially lose a lot of drug profits. That would be the end of its exclusivity and the generic can enter the market. Uh, for the generic, there's also a big win. They get this 180 day exclusivity period. But at the same time, due to the regulatory barriers here, the drug the, the owner of the, of, the, of the drug patent can potentially avoid this by paying just one party. If it pays one party to not bring the suit, it's very, it's, it's very unlikely that any other generic is going to challenge the patent. So you could sort of guarantee a full, uh, full uh, period of exclusivity by, by simply paying off this one this one uh, uh, generic and you well you could see it as paying off the generic or you could see it and and there's a lot of arguments in this or you could see it as sort of hedging the risk and saying well we really don't want to lose our exclusivity so we're gonna we're gonna just pay, we're just gonna do this reverse payment settlement we're gonna transfer some amount of money to the generic even though we think our patent is valid we're just not positive so we want to avoid, first of all, avoid the cost of litigation, but also avoid this huge risk of losing the remainder of our patent on this drug. And we invested a lot in, in developing it, and so we really, we don't want to take that risk. So what's the state of the law on this? How does this, how does this line up against antitrust law, right? Because in some ways, this, this may resemble a payment not to compete, right? I mean, if there were no patent here, it would just be a naked payment saying, hey, don't compete with us. Uh, it's complicated by the fact that there's this patent. So this is really a great example of the patent antitrust interface. On the one hand, you have a patent permitting exclusion. On the other hand, antitrust law saying, wait a minute, uh, you cannot simply pay somebody to stay out of the market. So pre-Actavis, pre it, apparently it's pronounced act Actavis, not Actavis. So pre-Actavis, uh, uh, according to my research by Michael Carrier, near, nearly all appeals courts to examine reverse payment settlements concluded that they do not represent an antitrust concern. In his words, the mere existence of a patent, regardless of validity, justified any payment under the theory that the patent conferred a statutory right of exclusion. So the idea was that, look, as long as there's a patent here, you're perfectly allowed to exclude others, and we're not going to mess around. We're not going to get involved in in deciding what kinds of licensing agreements can be entered um, in in the course of of, of um, achieving that exclusion. Now, in in this 2013 case, FTC v. Actavis, the Supreme Court really changes this law. And here are the facts: It's a basic reverse payment settlement. The drug manufacturer. Solve has a patented brand drug named Androgel and several years left on its patent. Several generic companies, Actavis et al., file an ANDA and they certify under paragraph 4 that Solve's patent is invalid or not infringed, thereby provoking litigation from Solve, which sues, sues, provokes litigation from Solve, and there's a 30, there's the stay to determine the patent infringement issue. But instead of going to trial over the patent claim, they settle. And in the course of the settlement, um, uh, Actavis, the generics are paid a significant, a significant sum of money. So the majority, uh, the case is, the opinion is, the majority opinion is written by Justice Breyer, and it, it holds, in, in contrast to this, the 11th Circuit, uh, applied the usual, the rule that many circuits were applying, and it says, look, this is, we're not going to touch this with antitrust law, there's, there's a patent here, and uh, uh, we can't review it as a matter of antitrust law as long as there's this patent, and the, the patent validity issue hasn't been decided, and there's already been a settlement, so we're just going to stay out of it. Breyer reverse, uh, overrules this, and, 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 and they, the majority holds that reverse payment settlements involving patents of unknown validity are subject to rule of reason antitrust scrutiny prior to determining patent validity and the scope of the patent holder's right to exclude. That's the basic holding, that, that 
you can use rule of reason antitrust scrutiny even aside from the issue of patent validity. So here's, here's what, uh, what the majority says. It, it would be incongruous to determine antitrust legality by measuring a settlement's anti-competitive effects solely against patent law policy rather than by measuring them against pro-competitive antitrust policies as well. And indeed, contrary to the 11th Circuit's view that the only pertinent question is whether the settlement agreement falls within the legitimate scope of the patent's exclusionary potential, this court has indicated that patent and antitrust policies are both relevant in, de both relevant in determining the scope of the patent monopoly and consequently antitrust law immunity that is conferred by a patent. So that's to say, look, the 11th Circuit basically used this idea of the scope of the patent monopoly as a def as a source of immunity, the, the the court says that's not that's not right. In fact, both patent and antitrust policy can help us determine the scope of the patent monopoly. So, remember, this is going back to what we talked about in the first lecture. And this whole time is antitrust law is supposed to only create liability for conduct involving patent exclusion when the patent holder acts outside of the scope of the patent right granted in the patent statute. But here the court is saying, no, you can actually use both patent and antitrust. Antitrust law is relevant to, for determining the scope of that monopoly. Okay, And so what, the, what this means in practice, the majority lays out a framework for using antitrust law and policy to assess these reverse payment settlements even before determining the issue of and of course the, the issue of patent infringement would never have been determined because there was a settlement so the court says irrespective of the settlement and the patent infringement issue we think that antitrust law can apply here and so the, the framework is as follows first is there a you know somewhat significant reverse payment by significant I mean that it's not just a usual kind of transfer to the defendant that might occur in a settlement. There's a significant transfer from the patentee to the alleged infringer. Second, uh, then if that's the case, then we assess the settlement considering five factors using always thinking of the rule of reason analysis. This is definitely not a per se rule. It's a rule of reason analysis. And the first factor is what's the anti-competitive effect of keeping the generic out? For example, would there be higher drug prices? Uh, for how many years would those would those occur? So we, so we do have to assess the evidence of any competitive effects. Second, is there some justification for the payment? Does it, for example, reflect foregone, foregone costs of litigating? Or does it look more like just a naked payment not to compete? And that's going to be, I think, difficult to determine, but that's the second factor. Third factor is, is there market power in the, in the patent market? Obviously, there has to be market power using rule of reason analysis. Fourth, I think this is very important, what's the relative size of the payment? Does the payment look so, is, is it so large, that at least this is my assessment of what's going on here, is the payment so large that it makes the patent appear highly likely to be invalid? That is, does it look like some kind of a bribe to stay out of the market and to not challenge a weak patent? And then the last factor is why was no settlement possible without a reverse payment settlement? Why is there some reason that it was just not possible to avoid the cost of litigation without making this transfer to the alleged infringer, the generic? And this leads us to an administrative paradox that to me is familiar because we saw it in the state law context as well. The 11th Circuit had reasoned that a reverse payment settlement agreement generally is, quote, immune from antitrust attacks so long as its anti-competitive effects fall within the scope of the exclusionary potential of the patent. Given that state of the law, the 11th Circuit had, had reasoned that courts cannot logically evaluate reverse payment settlements without a court first determining the validity and scope of the patent. So what that means is that how can we possibly do this antitrust analysis without knowing the validity and scope of the patent, which we won't know because there has been a settlement. And so that's why antitrust law can't apply here, according to the 11th Circuit. 
Now, the activist majority seems to have a solution to that based on the size of the payments. And the majority states, with respect to this concern, the majority states, in a word, the size of the unexplained reverse payment can provide a surrogate for a patent's weakness, all without forcing a court to conduct a detailed exploration of the validity of the patent itself. Now that is very, I think, crucial to understanding how the majority thinks this will actually work. So it's all going to be about how much, what, how big is the payment, and. That is very interesting, and, and Michael Carrier has a, another interesting piece on this uh, regarding no authorized generic promises, and he's looking at reverse reverse settlements that don't actually involve payments, but that involve promises not to promises by the patent holder not to uh, market their own generics, and that makes it even more complicated. And and um, the question is. You know what kinds of transfers to the to the defendant are going to be required to trigger some kind of concern here that says the patent's really weak, the patent's really weak. So that is going to be, I think, where a lot of the debate is going to happen in this. And the Octavius dissent does not uh, agree with this approach at all. Uh, Justice Roberts, Scalia, and Thomas Alito did not participate, but these three justices think that this is just a completely bad rule and that it overrules the settled approach of prior law. So first of all, the court says that we should we should simply follow the usual rule that a patent provides uh, an exception to antitrust law and that the scope of the patent, i.e. the rights conferred by the patent, forms a zone within which the patent holder may operate without facing antitrust liability. So that's just the general thing we've been seeing about this immunity based on the scope of the patent. And that would suggest not touching, not using antitrust law to touch these settlements so long as there's a patent involved. And the dissent further says the majority rule would impose antitrust liability based on the party's subjective uncertainty about patent validity under the assumption that offering a large sum is reliable evidence that a patent holder has serious doubts about the patent. And so what the, the dissent is saying is that, look, there can be, the, 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 it's not necessarily a bad thing that for the, it's not necessarily evidence of nefarious intent that a drug patent holder decides to, to simply pay the generic to stay out because of uncertainty about patent validity. That's just endemic to patent litigation. We don't always know for sure whether a patent is invalid or not. That doesn't necessarily mean it's it's weak. And so the, the, the court based the dissent thinks that the majority is relying too heavily on the size of the payment as gonna be reliable evidence of the of the sense of how valid the patent is. And as a policy matter, the dissent thinks that this is going to discourage settlements, weaken patent incentives, and depart from the settled approach separating patents and antitrust. So the, the dissent really emphasizes that this is this is just changing the law. And the uh, it, it's interesting to note that both the majority and the dissent are citing this case line material, which is an early earlier, much earlier antitrust case, but it's it's important because it verified that courts uh, had authority to review patent licenses that allegedly involved price fixing under antitrust law. And it had a similar issue there, was whether just the existence of a patent would say to antitrust, look, there's immunity, stay out. And in line material, the court had held, the Supreme Court held in a very important way that it was okay to review these kinds of agreements. and. Here, it seems to be a similar sort of key moment in and a, and a key and a very strong division between these two approaches. Should we let antitrust regulators come in and potentially interfere with what's going on in patent law, or should we just say, no, patents are, patents create this, this zone of immunity? So that's the Activis decision and that is pretty much all we are going to cover. And here's just a quick summary of what we did. We talked about the, the patent-to-product tying and the patent-to-patent tying. 
and the the conclusion there is that in order to prove that kind of a claim it's going to be hard first of all must show market power in the tying product or, or uh, the the tying po patented product uh, or the the tying patent uh, must uh, must show in some way that these are actually separate products and that means sort of uh, that there aren't truly significant efficiencies that make selling them together efficient and lastly it's it's all in the rule of reason analysis so there actually has to be analysis of the anti-competitive effects imposed by this tying arrangement so we also talked about uh, forms of enforcement liability, Walker process fraud on the one hand, meaning the patent was obtained through fraud on the PTO, the, pet, the, the patentee knew of the fraud when the suit was brought, and there's also this sham litigation, uh, sometimes called the handguards claim, and that is where the patentee didn't necessarily obtain the patent through fraud, but the lawsuit itself was objectively baseless and based on this subjective intent to interfere with competition. We also talk briefly about attorney's fees under Section 285, which, you know, which are available in exceptional cases. And the Supreme Court has recently held that this is not limited to cases uh, that meet this sham petition exception. That they, it's more of a um, discretionary standard in courts whether to award fees. We also talked about state law liability for bad faith patent assertions. And the question left open there is whether these laws are limited by the the rule of the federal circuit that the, the 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 assertions have to be objectively and subjectively baseless which of course requires deciding i think whether the patent is uh, whether the patent is is any good or not and that that's probably going to be something that has to be decided in federal court so the last thing we talked about are these reverse payment settlements and the Supreme Court has now held that rule of reason analysis under antitrust law is possible before oh, uh, before determining patent validity. So, so that is that is that is it. That is patents and antitrust and I hope that you enjoyed this unit and we will discuss this more in class when we do our exercise. Thank you.